I know of no one who has ever made this claim before, but I rather suspect that my experience is not unique. What perhaps is unique is the fact that I am willing to talk about it. We are living in a computer programmed reality and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present deja vu, perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words. I submit that these impressions are valid and significant. And I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed, reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off. It's New York City. It's okay. March 7th. Well, partly it's taken to these very strange images that are behind your head right now. <laughs> these are pictures of equations. I've been, for the last 15 years, trying to answer the kinds of questions that my colleagues here have been raising. And what I've come to understand is that there are these incredible pictures that contain all the information of a set of equations that are related to string theory. And it's even more bizarre than that because when you then try to understand these pictures, you find out that buried in them are computer codes just like the type that you find in a browser when you go surf the web. You're saying <laughs> your attempt to understand the fundamental operations of nature leads you to a set of equations that are indistinguishable from the equations that drive search engines and browsers on yeah, our computers. That is correct. So the wait, wait, I'm still, wait. I have to just be silent for a minute here. <laughs> So you're saying as you dig deeper, you find computer code writ in the fabric of the cosmos. Into the equations that we want to use to describe the cosmos, yes. Computer code. Computer code, strings of bits of ones and zeros. It's not just sort of resembles computer code, you're saying it is computer code. It's not even just is computer code, it's a special kind of computer code that was invented by a scientist named Claude Shannon in the 1940s. That's what we find very, very deeply inside the equations that occur in string theory and in general in systems that we call, say are supersymmetric. talk about. We are living in a computer programmed reality and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed. This is the construct. It's our loading program. We can load anything from clothing to equipment, weapons, training simulations, anything we need. Right now, we're inside a computer program? Is it really so hard to believe? Permission to speak freely, sir. I welcome it. 
do you? Okay, then. Are you out of your fucking mind? This is real. What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, what you can taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. physical is what he was talking about now next came Nick Bostrom and um, he uh, had his PhD from this very institution from uh, London School of Economics he's now at Oxford he was at Princeton I believe and uh, he's another uh, physicist uh, he's a physicist and a philosopher has degrees in both he wrote a paper are you living in a computer simulation and uh, he just went through it logically, and he found that it was impossible to say that it was impossible. Then he found out that it was unlikely to say that it was unlikely. That left him with the conclusion that uh, certainly almost all of us are living in a simulation. He said it was very likely. I mean, now, in his mind, the simulation is done from some other physical thing that's outside of what's physical so he wouldn't say that it's non-physical but that's that's where it lands it's beyond it's some other um, physical place besides ours that's how physicists say non-physical without using that word so that's that's was his um, conclusion that consciousness may indeed survive well there are many um, <clears throat> odd ways in which consciousness could survive and in, in way there's there you can make a, a philosophically respectable respectable argument that consciousness could survive the the, uh, the death of the brain um, it's by no means uh, the, the majority opinion in neuroscience or philosophy that it would uh, for instance there's a, a philosopher at Oxford Nick Bostrom uh, this is one of one of the weirder arguments uh, but still more plausible than the arguments you get from religion. Uh, <laughs> Nick, uh, there's actually very little you have to assume to make this seem somewhat robust. Uh, the argument is called the simulation argument, and he argues that uh, we are all very likely not, to, not living in a real universe, but living in a simulated universe. Uh, and we are being simulated on the hard drives of computers of the future. Uh, now he gets there with a few simple steps. You, uh, you simply have to acknowledge that consciousness is at bottom the result of information processing at the level of the brain. And there's nothing magical about brains. It could be information processing in a computer of, uh, of the future. Uh, most scientists think, that, think that's true. They don't think there's anything magical about the wet stuff in our heads. Uh, and that consciousness is at some point uh, going to be instantiated in computers. Uh, then you simply have to grant that humans of the future will run simulations of the past in the way that we run 
simulations, uh, you know, sims, games, and um, and then there's just one short move that, that simulated universes, by almost by definition, will outnumber real universes. And therefore, we are a lot more likely to be among the simulated ancestors than the real ancestors. Now again, this is, this everyone acknowledges it seems a little crazy, but there's, but the assumptions that you have to, you take, take on board are not, not so weak. Um, and I would add to this, uh, the somewhat disconcerting idea that if in fact we are running as a simulation on a computer of the future, uh, this computer could have been built by Mormons or Scientologists who would want to simulate the truth of their religion. Um, and therefore all religions could be true in this simulated universe and we could expect to see Jesus coming back in, in clouds of glory and moving to Missouri as the, as the uh, Mormons expect. <laughs>
We're going to do physics first, and then we'll do metaphysics. Physics. The main piece of physics that is probing at the fundamentals of reality right now is quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics basically sees particles as probability distributions. It sees the fundamentals of our existence as a probability distribution. You've probably heard of the uh, double slit experiment. It's kind of a famous thing in physics, but some of you are probably not physicists. An electron is a tiny, tiny bit of matter, like a tiny marble. Let's fire a stream through one slit. It behaves just like the marble, a single band. So, if we shoot these tiny bits through two slits, we should get, like the marbles, two bands. What? An interference pattern. We fired electrons, tiny bits of matter, through. But we get a pattern like waves, not like little marbles. How? How could pieces of matter create an interference pattern like a wave? It doesn't make sense. But physicists are clever. They thought, maybe those little balls are bouncing off each other and creating that pattern. So they decide to shoot electrons through one at a time. There is no way they could interfere with each other. But after an hour of this, the same interference pattern is seen to emerge. The conclusion is inescapable. The single electron leaves as a particle, becomes a wave of potentials, goes through both slits, and interferes with itself to hit the wall like a particle. But mathematically, it's even stranger. It goes through both slits and it goes through neither. And it goes through just one and it goes through just the other. All of these possibilities are in superposition with each other. But physicists were completely baffled by this. So they decided to peek and see which slit it actually goes through. They put a measuring device by one slit to see which one it went through and let it fly. <laughs> but the quantum world is far more mysterious than they could have imagined. When they observed, the electron went back to behaving like a little marble. It produced a pattern of two bands, not an interference pattern of many. The very act of measuring or observing which slit it went through meant it only went through one, not both. The electron decided to act differently, as though it was aware it was being watched. And it was here that physicists stepped forever into the strange never world of quantum events. What is matter? Marbles or waves? And waves of what? And what does an observer have to do with any of this? The observer collapsed the wave function simply by observing. Okay, now there are many interpretations of why uh, it does this and what it means. A lot of physicists have been trying. Now, this, this was started back in the early, late 20s and the 30s. All of this was, was a big deal, and physicists were working very hard on this. They're still a big deal and working hard on it. They haven't really made any progress since the 20s and 30s, made very little uh, real progress. And all of, the, all of the theories of what does it mean, what is it saying about reality, um, none of them have made it into the center of physics. They're all on the fringe. I'll just talk about a couple of them. The one that's most common is called the Copenhagen Interpretation. Basically what it says is that if you have a probability of being in n states, when you measure it, you just get a random value. One of those states, randomly, you get that, you measure that value. Okay, then there's one that says consciousness causes collapse, and that comes from the idea that you have to be aware, you have to measure it. Some consciousness has to take a measurement, and that that causes it to collapse to the measured value. Now when I say collapse, it's a wave function. They talk about wave functions, but it's really probability wave is what we're talking about. Cause it to collapse to a certain value. Another one is called uh, consistent histories. And that says, well, it's not random state that it collapses to. It's a state based on 
what happened before, what his history was. And then there's one of many worlds, and I have to mention that David Dutch at uh, Oxford is uh, one of your countrymen. He's one of the uh, foremost uh, uh, researchers in the many worlds area. Actually, he's published some, some very good work just recently on this, made some progress. The many worlds says that, all right, you have end states that it could be in. That means it's probability function. In, in quantum mechanics, you don't necessarily have a smeared continuous probability. There's a probability in only certain states can, can exist. So if there's n states, he says all n of them happen. Everything that can happen does happen, except the one that happens in this reality, you know, is where we live. The ones that happen in other parallel realities, you know, we don't know about. But there is a separate physical parallel reality for every state. Well, of course, there's billions of states. Every electron has multiple states. You know, there's a lot of electrons. So you know, there's a problem. There's a problem here as well. The problem, of course, that they had with the, with the Copenhagen one is that uh, if, they're, if it's just a random choice, then that creates two problems. One, all of this reality that we see before us is based upon random choices. That does not compute. Also, that means that if you do the same experiment twice, you won't get the same answer. Well, physicists don't like that either. So both of those were problems. That's why I say none of these theories are problem-free. Okay, there was another one called Many Minds. It was sort of a combination of consciousness causes collapse in many worlds. And basically, uh, it said that the many worlds weren't physical, but they were uh, mental. And they fill it with their subconscious. How could I ever acquire enough detail to make them think that it's reality? Well, dreams, they feel real while we're in them, right? It's only when we wake up that we realize something was actually strange. Let me ask you a question. You, you never really remember the beginning of a dream, do you? You always wind up right in the middle of what's going on. I guess, yeah. So how did we end up here? Well, we just came from the, uh... Think about it, Ariadne. How did you get here? Where are you right now? We're dreaming. You're actually in the middle of the workshop right now, sleeping. This is your first lesson in shared dreaming. All right, now there's other big pictures besides that one. Edward Fredkin created digital physics in 1992 when he published two papers. The first one was Finite Nature. The second one was A New Cosmogony. And uh, Edward Fred Fredkin is really a pretty high-powered physicist. Uh, he was a physicist at MIT, then went to Boston University. Now he's in Carnegie Mellon. He's kind of specialized in the digital side of, of, uh, of um, information theory and physics. And uh, his conclusions were that reality is a computed simulation, that we are in a computed simulation. And he presented this paper at a scientific uh, uh, forum. And, uh, was not received real well, I think. Probably didn't get a long applause. It kind of startled a lot of people. But he was a very brave man for doing that. But he had solid physics to back it up. That's why he stood up and did it. Um, essentially, he says our reality is digital. Time's digital. Space is digital. Um, essentially, it's informational. He says our reality is just information. Okay. He also said that because a system cannot compute itself, it must be computed in his words, other. It was computed in other. Okay, he didn't want to go there where it was computed. He knew it couldn't be computed in this reality frame. Okay, so he says it came from a reality frame that's outside of our physical reality. Well, now how do we define non-physical reality? Non-physical reality is basically other, is it not? We have a physical matter reality. That's our universe. That's us. There's everything in the universe, and then there's everything else. And that's non-physical reality. So everything is not physical in that concept, non-physical. So if this is in other, then in that, with that definition, he's basically saying that it's computed in a non-physical, even if you say some other physical reality that isn't physical. You know, that's cheating. It's the non-physical.
And in 1945, while they were digging for some clay and that sort of thing, uh, some uh, Egyptian peasant found a, uh, 13 large books. Remember the, the word codex or codices I talked about in the, uh, one of the early lectures means the kind of book that has, the pa has pages and not all sewn up on one side to distinguish it from a book that's in a scroll form. So this, by this time he found these books. They had been buried there probably sometime in the 4th century, so in the 300s. And they'd probably been hidden there because that's about the time that certain forms of Christianity were being outlawed and declared heretical. There are 13 of these big books, and right, it's right along the Nile River. And we call these the Nag Hammadi Library or the Nag Hammadi Corpus. Therefore, I say that such a person, once integrated, will become full of light. But such a person, once divided, will become full of darkness. So there's a divided, integrated dualism that's going on in this text also. Uh, the kingdom is invisible. I think I've already pointed this out. The idea is that the kingdom is not something you say, look, it's over there, or look, it's here. Uh, One thirteen. I've already read that. Uh, the kingdom of the Father is spread out over the earth, but most people don't see it. And then look at saying three right at the very beginning. Jesus said, if those who lead you say to you, see, the kingdom is in heaven, then the birds of heaven will precede you. If they say to you, it is in the sea, then the fish will precede you. But the kingdom is inside of you, and it is outside of you. When you become acquainted with yourself, now the word acquainted here means when you become really knowledgeable, and it comes from, the Greek word here is gnosis, where we get the term Gnostics. That Greek word means gnosis, but it, does, it means gnosis in, a, in, a, in some kinds of technical way in these documents, which is, it's not something you just know with your head. It's something you really, really know. And so to express that, uh, Professor Layton usually translates this word as acquaintance or becoming acquainted with it. When you become acquainted with yourselves, then you will be recognized and you will understand that it is you who are children of the living Father. But if you do not become acquainted with yourself, if you don't have gnosis of yourself, then you are in poverty and it is you who are the poverty. Platonism itself might be called proto-Gnostic, that is, Gnosticism before Gnosticism. Uh, for example, in Platonism, especially at this time, you have a strong emphasis of a dualism of body and soul, or body and spirit. And in that dualism, often the body or the materiality, the fleshly existence, the harder matter of things, becomes less good, sometimes even probably bordering on evil in some people's thought, and spirit or the soul or the mind is the good thing. So you have a mind-body dualism, uh, a body and soul dualism. And often there's a deprecation of the body and a deprecation of matter as morally inferior. Now why would matter be considered inferior to non-material substance? Because uh, what happens to your body eventually? You all have gorgeous bodies now, but eventually you're going to look like me. Your hair is going to fall out, your ears are going to get too big, your nose won't stop growing, and then eventually you'll get even get beyond me and you'll die and you'll rot and you'll disappear. The body is material and the ancient thinkers all knew that matter passes away. Anything that is material is going to pass away and, and be destroyed and be gone. But things that are not material like ideas. An idea, the great thing about an idea is that it never need die. So the spirit of the soul in Platonic theory was superior to material stuff because, and it was the only thing that could live forever, be inf infinite. They also sometimes you see, especially in later Platonism, the idea that not only is the, is the body temporary, not eternal, and passing away, but the body is also a prison. Because your spirit, they believed, wants to get out of the body. Aren't you frustrated that you can't just escape your body and, and go off and go someplace else for a while and, and zoom out of your, your body and, and go to Argentina for the weekend? You know, not have to pay for airfare? Or, you know, so the idea was that the body imprisons your spirit and your soul. And this has come to be a part of Platonism at the time. 
So what scholars will call basic Gnosticism includes some basic themes that they hold in common. First, the world itself, which is material, is evil. Salvation, therefore, from the world must be escape from this physical world into something else. Gross materiality is not only temporary in some texts, but even bad. It's evil. And salvation, therefore, must be the knowledge of how you, that is the real you, your brain, your, I mean not your brain, your mind or your soul or your spirit, not your body, that real you is existing in this material body, but salvation will be if it can learn how to escape the body and escape materiality. That not, salvation will become by knowledge, and that knowledge is a secret. Not everybody knows it. So only a few people know it. The content of this knowledge is related to human origins and destination. We were, we were all creation, not of the supreme God who would do nothing imperfect, but of some stumbling or evil, at least clumsy God, who made us. That explains why, you know, things go wrong. Why is it that my arthritis acts up all the time? Couldn't God have made a human body that didn't have arthritis? Well, that's because the supreme God didn't make this body. The evil, clumsy God made the body. This happened, and so the, the world that we created, when you read in Genesis, it says God created the world, that's not the highest God. That's some clumsy God down further on the hierarchy of divine beings in the universe. That God created what we are. The true message of Christianity, according to these guys, is to learn who you are, where you came from, to, so you can escape the body and get back to your true origin. That is, you will become one with God again. And this was expressed in a poem by Theodotus. It went like this. Who we were, what we have become, where we were, whither we were thrown, whither we are hastening, from what we are redeemed, what birth is, what rebirth is. Okay, now you answer the riddle. It's a poem riddle. Who we were. If you're a Gnostic, who were you? Answer. Divine, Divine being. being. Thank you. See, it's not hard. I'm not answering questions. I'm just trying you, you'll remember this better if you answer. What have you become? Mud, entrapped in a, a dead body, entrapped in materiality. Where were you? Heaven, with the Divine Father, with God. Whither we were thrown, where have you been thrown? Into the earth, into the world, into materiality. Where are you hastening? Where are you going in, a in such a hurry? Back to the Divine God. What are you redeemed from? You're redeemed from Jesus? The material world. You're redeemed from being embodied. Uh, what is birth? In this system, what is birth? Damnation, death. When you're born, your spark is entrapped in your body. That's not a good thing. You shouldn't be celebrating your birthday for crying out loud. That's like celebrating when you were thrown in prison. And what is rebirth? Death, or learning your true self. Learning that you, the true self won't die at all. It's never just a dream, is it? When a face full of glass hurts like hell when you're in it, it feels real. Hey!